We will create an American Film Institute, bringing together leading artists of the film industry, outstanding educators, and young men and women who wish to pursue the 20th century art form as their life's work. We honor a great profession, all of the people in the motion picture profession. Thank you very much. International Film Festival. I'm a movie girl. I've loved the movie since I was a small boy. It's a quarter of a century that the AFI has nourished the art of the moving image. Film Institute for partnering with us on this event. It's a great example of what happens when we just unleash the skills and the imagination of America's young people. The stuff that dreams are made of. Well, you can count on the American Film Institute to put together a good montage reel. So uh, I want to welcome you on this afternoon. My name is David Schwartz. I'm the chief curator here at the Museum of the Moving Image. And I'm so uh, pleased to have this chance to celebrate the American Film Institute. Um, I just have been thinking so much about all the different ways that I've been affected in my life being interested in film by the AFI. Um, I used to always read film, um, American Film Magazine. Um, I always was consulting the reference books, the directories of, of American film, looking at the top 100 list, watching movies that came out of the AFI program, directors like uh, Terrence Malick and David Lynch and so many others. Um, you know, there are just so many ways that the AFI has influenced our, our culture and our understanding and appreciation of film. And in some ways, I think the AFI is both, in a way, almost taken for granted. It does so much. Um, and, um, and I think finally, there is a book, I'm glad to say, that celebrates the 50-year anniversary, the 50 years of the AFI. Um, becoming, AF, becoming AFI, 50 years inside the American Film Institute. And this is a great read. It is um, actually a thick book, many pages. Um, but if you don't read a lot these days, there are great pictures. There's a set, everybody ta has been talking about how much they love the pictures in this book. But it's, um, it's an incredible story. And the co-authors of the book are here with us today. Um, James Heinemann and, and the woman you're about to meet, Jean Picker Furstenberg. And they have been at the AFI for so many years. I mean, I think when you hear AFI, you think Jean Picker Furstenberg, I think, first and foremost. So I am going to ask her to come up. Uh, we have an incredible panel, but I first want to invite Jean to come up and um, welcome you and say a few words. <laughs> you. OK, so. I asked David if I could just say a few words to start us off because I wanted to thank him and thank the museum for inviting us to be here today. This is an incredible place. And I remember in the 80s when Shelley Slovin was trying to make this place work and she should be very proud as the founding director to what it has become. And uh, it's not easy, we all know that. But we are um, sister institutions. And everyone here today is here because they love the movies. 
And I wanted to give you a little context for why I'm here today, because I grew up in a family that loved the movies with a grandfather and a father who were in the exhibition world. And what did my dad do every day? He watched two movies. Can you imagine a job like that, where you get to watch two movies a day, and then he would come home and tell us, you know, one was really awful. But then there were the good ones. Um, I would not be standing here today if it weren't for my grandfather and my father, and particularly for my brother, because my brother followed in the family footsteps and became a great executive and a great producer. And when I applied for the AFI job, I was an unknown, except that I had the name Picker after my first name. And when the folks out in Hollywood said, oh, she's David Picker's sister, she'll be fine. And so I'm just here to say thank you to my dear brother for paving the way for me to uh, have the opportunity to go to the AFI and now, <clears throat> a lot of years later, to tell that story. Um, I'm also very fortunate because uh, I have a, a wonderful family and my daughter is here. I think some of you met her earlier. I have six grandchildren and they go by, uh, they call themselves number one and I think she just walked out. Uh, oh, good, good. Um, and so number one is here, number two is here, and number five is here and they're waving, that's very good. And many of you met uh, the, the joy of our lives. My great granddaughter, there she is, wave. <laughs> so I am indeed a very, very fortunate person and so thrilled to be able to share this with, with my family here. Uh, you're gonna have a wonderful panel. Uh, and I want to thank also so many friends who were here who made this possible. And Jill Sackler, who's an AFI trustee and a wonderful friend. And I want to introduce one other person because we are sister institutions. And uh, you have wonderful representation from the NYU Film School on the panel. But I also wanted to uh, recognize the dean of the USC Cinema School, who also happens to be Jamie Heinemann's wife, Elizabeth Daly. And thank you for being here, Elizabeth, because it really, all of us who do what we do, do it for the same reason. We do it because we love film and because we want to help young people become artists who can tell their stories that can help us all get through hard times that we're going through now and good times, because that's what artists do. Their stories help us understand the world that we're in. So it's a pleasure for me to be here, and I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who came. Thank you, David. Okay, thank you. So we have our um, co-author, James Heinemann, taking a seat next to Jean. Barbara Koppel. <laughs> Barbara Koppel is making her newest documentary here. Ter uh, Terry Lawler with New York Woman in Film and Television. Paul Warner great cinematographer of Fred Elms, and Barbara Schock, who runs the NYU graduate production uh, program. So thank you, thank you all of you for being here. Um, and uh, Jean, I actually wanted to just start, uh, I wanted to hear a little bit more, I, I just love hearing about your family, I want to hear, just hear a little bit more about your grandfather, because one detail you mentioned in the book is that you used to um, drive out here with your granddad to look at uh, the well, Lowe's yeah. movie theaters out here in, in Queens. Well, actually, it was my I dad. I just make sure your mic is, uh, yeah, great. My, my father, uh, w uh, when my grandfather passed away at a very young age, my father left college, and he went to Lowe's Theaters to watch over the family uh, property. My grandfather had built uh, Nickelodeons mm. in the Bronx and in Queens and in Brooklyn, not in Manhattan. <laughs> and... Um, 
the great movie palaces were then built on, on this land where the Nickelodeons were. So my father rose through the ranks at Lowe's Theaters and um, every weekend we would drive to a different, to, to a different uh, borough and look at all of the theaters in Brooklyn. Uh, and we'd, I'd see the movie for 10, 15 minutes while he was checking on everything. Then we'd drive 10 minutes to the next site and I'd see, now remember these were double bills, so at the end of the day I wanted to see the end of the movie. <laughs> it was the greatest childhood you could have growing up in the movies, in those big screens, in magnificent theaters like this. <laughs> um, and, and, and another thing I wanted to ask you about just, because you talked about your name, the name Picker and the value the name Picker had, but you, I think in the book you talk about how you, you shied away from using that. And when you, when you, you have decided... To re no, no, just no. read chapter two. Okay. That's all. Oh, now you have, to, you have to buy the book. We're not going to go through the whole thing. Okay. Okay. Well, tell us, um, you know, to sort of kick things off then and talking about the history of the American Film Institute, could you talk a bit more about those, you know, the founding of it? Because you were there, I guess you knew through your... Um, Dad was one of the first trustees, but just... My uncle. Your my uncle, uncle, sorry. All, all the uncles were in the business. Yeah. You know, if you're a picker, you went into the business, except I was the maverick. I was the maverick because I didn't care about what happened at the box office. And uh, our, my uh, uncle said, if Jeannie likes a movie, be careful, it'll bomb at the box office. <laughs> so that's what that said. That's my family heritage. Yeah, but could you just talk a little bit about more about, about that peer, that incredible moment in, in history when the government was, you know, within, it was around the time that the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities were launched. Um, it, it, it's a great, and that's really chapter one, okay? Um, you still have to buy the book, everybody. <laughs> the government had never supported the arts. And... Um, JFK really would have, he cared about the arts. He knew, understood the profound nature of what artists meant to our society. When he passed away, Lyndon Baines Johnson, great society, carried on that tradition. And it was a time, I really recommend to you actually, reading the foreword by Dana Joya, who is a brilliant, brilliant poet who ran the National Endowment for the Arts from 2003 to 2009. He was a, a Bush 43 appointee, and Obama wanted him to stay on, but he needed to go back into writing, which he has done. And he explains it was a time in our culture when Republicans and Democrats worked together. And that's how the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the uh, uh, Humanities legislation got passed. And it was a moment in time. And many Republican presidents have tried to kill the endowments. That's another chapter in the book. See, you've <laughs> got to buy the book. <laughs> but, and, and as a result of that legislation passing, the AFI was created. It, it's, it's a fascinating 50-year journey. It really is. Great. And uh, what I'd like to do is just um, quickly go one by one and just, just have each of you introduce yourself and say what your relationship with the AFI was because we have I think we're all either alumni or work there and have all gone on to you know been doing a lot of other things so James why don't you start thanks uh, yeah Jean and I have spent many years together uh, she started in 1980 I came in 1980 on sabbatical from uh, American University in Washington uh, to do a project I was very interested in video and new technologies and uh, AFI had just gotten a major relationship going with Sony. And Sony, who, with its long Japanese view of the future and its business plan, was very interested in m having a connection to film and television uh, in the US. And they funded a video festival that we did at the Kennedy Center in Washington, which was our base, and that was my first major, I was the director of the festival, and uh, I w had such a good time that I called the university and said, you know what, I'm not coming back. <laughs> yes, I know I'm tenured, but what the hell, this is a lot more fun than, uh, you know, it, you could get your phone calls returned, which I loved. 
Uh, you certainly couldn't as an academic. Uh, anyway, uh, so, but the, shortly after I, I decided to stay, uh, Gene informed me that, oh, by the way, the job's in Los Angeles. Like, where? Uh, they had, the, uh, Gene had done a brilliant job at, or you'll get this in the book, uh, uh, orchestrating the purchase of a permanent home for AFI in LA, the Immaculate Heart College campus that uh, is so, such a lovely treasure for the place. Anyway, so the job was out there. I came in and uh, did a lot of work in television and video and training and new programs and ended up as the co-director uh, uh, with Gene for 20, I was there 24 years, so a good long time. And had a marvelous time with it, uh, developing programs, uh, growing the place. Uh, she was fantastic as a partner. Uh, we, uh, we, we really did a lot of interesting stuff together. That's in the book because it was a chance to see, you know, not only what have we done, but what could we do? What, what, haven't, what haven't we done yet that we ought to try? And that was really the, the kind of theme uh, for the time that we were there. Anyway, that, that gives you an overview. I particularly focused on the, uh, the AFI Conservatory uh, the Center for Advanced Film Studies, it was originally called. That's in the book, but a lot of other interesting uh, projects are in there, and we'll talk about them today if we have a chance. Anyway, that's okay. my story. Okay, thanks. And Barbara? I like your story. <laughs> <laughs> Is this on? Yes. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's on. Maybe there's a switch? Let's Testing. Oh, okay. <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Okay, this is on. All right. I have so many stories to tell about the American Film Institute. Ah, he gave it back to me. Okay. Uh, I just don't even know where to begin, so I guess I'll just begin at the beginning. Um, I wanted to do this film called Harlan County, USA was a film about coal miners in eastern Kentucky. And I had followed it from, you know, Arnold Miller, who was a coal miner himself, running against W.A. Tony Boyle. And then Tony Boyle was convicted of the murders of Yablonsky, his wife and daughter. And Arnold Miller won. And his first promise was to organize the unorganized. And of course, I was going to follow it. So I went to eastern Kentucky, Harlan County, where you live and you die by your gun. And they had been trying to organize a union since the 1930s. And I came as they were trying to organize a union. I had no money whatsoever. I had people saying to me, why is a little girl like you <laughs> want to do a film like this. And that just gave me added strength. And I go, educational, sir. You know, <laughs> no threat to you. And anyway, I applied because there was this wonderful grant given to independence. And I knew that Hollywood studios didn't need this grant. So I figured, well, maybe it's for people like me. And I applied and got a grant for $10,000. And I mean, my poor parents were supporting everything and sending me film and I was sending it back to them. And when I got this grant, it just meant the world to me because it meant maybe somebody really out there cares about what I'm doing. And um, it just gave me super confidence to continue on and it allowed us to film for a very long time. And so that was my first of many experiences with the AFI. Great, thank you. Terry. So I was a staff person. Yes. Uh, I was uh, on the staff of AFI from 1986 to 1991. I worked in a variety of different areas. I worked on the video festival. Um, I worked uh, on the grant makers programs and um, a variety of training programs for television writers. I also worked closely with the director of the directing workshop for women, Tess Martin, 
um, and uh, served on the panel to help choose the the women that would be involved in that program. And you know, since now I am the director of New York Women in Film and Television, I've uh, continued to be in touch with the program. We have a, a number of our members are graduates of the program. Lots of people we're very proud of who've done um, excellent work. Um, so uh, I continue to have a relationship through through the a with the AFI, through the DWW, but also we have a Women's Film Preservation Fund, so we have worked together on preservation, which I'm sure we'll talk about at some point. Okay, Paul, yeah. Um, so I, I attended the AFI uh, in the directing program, um, and I had the, the kind of special way that I came to the AFI was uh, I'd been directing theater, and I started working for Ed Zwick as his assistant on Glory, and he kept for this entire year, because I was gonna go back and be in residence at the second stage here in New York, and he kept saying, no, you, sh you should attend the AFI. <laughs> Um, throughout the entire year, uh, and um, I, as I worked with him on Glory for about a year and a half, I became um, so deeply in love with the actual process, because I'd only directed theater. Um, and I was fortunate enough to attend when Deja Magyar was running the school um, as a directing instructor, so my experimental theater approach <laughs> Um, the first film was about a tab can uh, in a loft. Um, I was able to explore with the embracing of this man and Jean uh, so many different kinds of uh, styles and approaches. Um, in fact, the second film was kind of inspired by um, you, <laughs> uh, uh, David Lynch. Um, and that led to my thesis film, which was uh, much bigger uh, about uh, called In the Name of the Father, which um, really helped move things to the next level. Um, one of the great things that I learned there was about collaboration. Um, that, that's really one of the great things that I took away and the diversity of the people that I was working with. So I'm very thankful. Okay, and Fred. Fred. Oh wait, let's see. I think we. Uh -oh. No, no, no. It's uh -huh. probably just a switch. Yeah, there you go. Switch. Make sure. Okay. Anyway, I was there at the AFI uh, Conservatory from almost the beginning, uh, slightly before the advent of popular video <laughs> equipment. <laughs> um, so we were pretty much stuck using film. Um, we, um, you know, it was a wonderful program. It was an eye-opening eye experiment, really. I came from uh, film school in New York and had a great time there, uh, really wanted to make dramatic feature films and it didn't seem to be happening in New York, certainly not for me, so this was an introduction to, to Los Angeles and the way the business works there, the studio system a little bit, um, and, and a real um, oh, eye-opening look at the way a movie is put together. So. You know, on all counts, uh, it, it, it educated me and it, it introduced me to people, um, including, you know, some of the fellows in my, my years that I was there that I'm still in touch with and work with occasionally. Um, one of my favorite things about the AFI um, was this whole new idea uh, of a directing workshop for women. Um, it, was, it, was, it was like uh, a lightning bolt. It was some, uh, some new concept that uh, we could uh, help women who were working in the film industry make uh, films as directors and writers. Uh, even if they were actors before, it gave them, uh, kind of uh, welcomed them with open arms and gave them a little push to get their story made. Um, and I was lucky to work with several of those directors and uh, you know, f formed some long, long relationships th through it. Uh, but it is about that, that sense of, of community and networking um, that, uh, you know, was really the strength of the AFI for me. Okay, thanks. And Barbara, our other Barbara, Barbara Schock. <laughs> Hello. So I was a student at the conservatory. I started in 1994 when Jean and Jamie were there and Deju was there. It took me a little while to get there. I was in my mid to late 30s by the time I got there. Um, if you'll bear with me for a minute, I'll, I'll go back to my childhood. 
I grew up on a farm in South Dakota, and my father uh, took home movies in 16 mm. millimeter, and of five children, I was the only one really interested, and he would let me um, use the camera. The first film I ever made was of some ducklings that had just hatched, and after he looked at it, he said, next time, uh, d uh, record the motion, don't provide it. <laughs> and I ended up, I was the only child who liked to thread the projector, and, and it was that great old e Kodak ECO stock. So <laughs> uh, I would say the next thing was we, we tried to save our, our herd of pregnant cattle uh, in a monster blizzard, and they all died. And that weekend, mm. I went to see Harold and Maude three times. <laughs> and I was hooked. And so I went to university. I got out of South Dakota and went to UCSD and studied with Manny Farber, who's a very well-known film critic and painter who was phenomenally influential in my life. And I knew I wanted to work with film, so I hooked up with a male director and produced for him. He, and he was a much better writer than he was a director. And as I watched him, I thought, I could do this. Hmm. So I started to get jobs in LA. I moved to LA, and I started to assist directors. And I applied. I was so excited to hear about the DWW. And I applied, and I didn't get in. Great. And, and so <laughs> <laughs> it actually was great for me. So I kept working. <laughs> I went on and I became David Fincher's assistant on his first feature in London. And, it, and I worked for Carl Franklin, the director, who was an AFI grad. And he said, well, why don't you apply to the conservatory? So I did. And it, it was a fantastic experience for me. I, I grew with each film. And um, anyway, I'm very glad to be here tonight. And thank you for inviting me. And now I, I'm in education. By the way, I tell that story about coming from the farm in South Dakota because I ended up winning uh, an Academy Award for my thesis AFI film. And I'll tell you, if there were, were not places like the AFI or NYU where I'm the chair, there would be no young women from South Dakota winning Academy Award. Wow, yeah. wow that's great. Yeah. That's a great story. That sounded like a, that sounded like a movie. Yes. That's good. Um, wow. So what I'd like to do, we, we have, we're gonna, we're mainly here to talk today, but we have two clips we're gonna show. And, and the first one, is from Harlan County, USA. So I want to thank um, Barbara for, for providing the clip and, and the film. I mean, it's great to hear you talk about it, but this is a film that, you know, it's, ama it's a, just amazing to think of the way, how important that film is and how timely it is. And this, probably, I think probably a lot of people have this experience these days where you look at a movie and you think you, think you knew that movie, but in the context of what's going on in the world today, like certain movies seem... V timely when you hope they wouldn't be so timely, but um, let's just show let's just show this clip, um, this yeah, very vivid clip from Harlan County, USA.
to me in order to be able to say, well, we'll bring five or we'll bring 10 or we'll bring 15. And that would be working together. Wow. <laughs> Still so good. God, we could talk forever about that film. There's so much in it. I just, I want to maybe just briefly ask you though, what um, you didn't know you were making a classic American film at the time. Like you didn't even know if you were going to survive the filming. And and I don't know. Just could you talk about that aspect of it? Like going in there, not knowing what you're going to get, putting yourself in danger. Oh yeah. well, I was really young. So when you're <laughs> Right. When you're really young, you think you're going to live forever and you're invincible. And, you know, I came out of um, the Vietnam era and marched against the war and, you know, sort of considered myself somebody who could not be intimidated. I was a little intimidated when the head gun thug that came over, he said, if I ever catch you alone, I'm going to kill you. Uh -huh. And I said, I promise, Basil, you will never catch me alone. <laughs> wow. But it was very scary. We slept on the floors of the miners' house, and at night they would shoot up the miners' homes. And when I first got there, the organizers brought me in and opened up you know, this suitcase of guns and asked me which one I would want. I grew up in Scarsdale, New York. <laughs> Never touched a gun in my life. And there was a tiny little pink gun, so I decided <laughs> <laughs> that I would take that one. And he said, that's not going to do you any good. <laughs> so I was given a 357 Magnum. Wow. Which they taught me how to use. And then also, I guess, high-powered rifles that you'd have to hold at your shoulder. And if you did it wrong, you would be bruised. Wow. But... Uh, for me, it was the, one of the most incredible experiences of my life. I understood what life and death was all about, and not to be cliche, I learned what it meant for people to stand up for what they believed in, even if it cost them a life, and a minor was killed by a company foreman in this film, and yeah. it was just, I mean, I didn't want to go home. I didn't know how I could adapt to going home. Mm. I mean, there was no running water. There was outhouses. We slept on the floors or on mattresses with the coal miners. But I think it was one of the most pivotal experiences of my life. Wow, amazing. Thank you. Um, one thing I wanted to uh, open up to really, this is some, a topic that I think all of us could talk about, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. But the AFI, when I, when I think of it, I always think of the dichotomy of the fact that you're in Hollywood, uh, that you know there were some big stars, people like Gregory Peck and so many of the big stars were involved with it. So you think of Hollywood, you think of this, um, the setting of the AFI, but I always associate the AFI with independent film and with personal filmmaking. Like It seems like that tension has always been there. And um, you know, Harlan County is a great example. We're going to look at Eraserhead a little bit later on. But I, I'm just wondering if you could, jumping off of that idea, could talk about about that that split. I'll let Jamie because it's yeah. a, it's a theme in the book. It's a really interesting question. What God, we're going to really sell a lot of copies, <laughs> I think. Uh, it's it's a really interesting question because we saw, you know, I came in uh, as an independent filmmaker and an academic. And uh, there were these incredible Hollywood figures that I, I was dealing with. And what became clear to me personally was it was means and ends. These people were there because they thought film was and should be an art form. And they were willing to support that. And they had 
the leverage, they had the prestige, and in many cases the resources to help make that happen. So we saw, okay, these are the means, the support is the means. The ends are the diversity, the voices that can't get heard and aren't heard. Our job is to provide access. Our job is to provide visibility. Our job is to provide attention to the whole range of voices uh, from, and the forgotten films, the classic films, the foreign films, the the independent voices that, that might only be regional. It was our job to give as much uh, presence and credit to that sort of thing as we possibly could. That was at least ours, our, and it was very mission driven. I mean, we were, we were not, God knows we weren't there getting rich. Uh, <laughs> it was very much about the mission and the passion. And, uh, and uh, Jean, as my colleague, set a tone that we all worked hard for, that it was a family that it was a group of people committed to one another. And that, that was wh what kept us going when it got dark, and occasionally it would get dark. Uh, but that's what kept us going was that family commitment. This is, we shared a vision, we shared a mission. Did we always live up to it? Certainly not. But by God, we were gonna try as hard as we could, as long as we could. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear from some of the filmmakers, like Paul or Fred or Barbara, you went in, you know, the idea of making films, and how did you think you were going to relate to Hollywood, or, or what were the, you know, what was your idea about what you wanted to do with, with film, and how that related to the AFI? Um, well, I mean, the, this is what I was saying before, one of the things that was very uplifting was I went in with a lot of different ideas that were not necessarily cookie cutter, you know, I wasn't yeah. interested in action movie or formulaic things, um, and uh, one, of the f one of the first things I did was um, a project with Alexis Arquette that was kind of this surreal kind of move, a version of exploration with Hustlers. Uh, with uh, Sam Rockwell was also in this. Um, and I was like worried that when I went in to present it, because you, you do three films in the first year, um, that, you know, it was it was not classically structured, it was much more expressionistic that uh, it would get sort of, you know, torn apart. <laughs> um, but Adeju immediately embraced it, gave a lot of notes, and from that point forward, I felt the, um, you know, the comfort to continue to experiment and not have to follow a formula. I felt that throughout the entire first year there. Um, so. That, I mean, that's for me, I mean, this independence uh, um, is one of the reasons why I chose to go there over anywhere else, actually. Mm. And ba Barbara or Fred, do you want to try, sort of talk about the same topic? Like, what were the kinds of films you thought you were making? I'd love to know, like, what you and David thought you were I, concocting. That's a good question. Yeah. I, <laughs> you know, I went to the AFI as an extension of my, my time at, at NYU Graduate Film School. Mm. I really wanted to make dramatic feature films I didn't know anything about it. I, I was just beginning and, and wanted to get uh, my foot in the door, to get an education, to, to learn about it. Um, I was lucky at the AFI right from the start to meet David Lynch, to become involved in, in his early project, Eraserhead, and, and to follow through and, and shoot a couple of more films with him. Um, I also met at the same moment uh, John Cassavetes, who had a, a brief relationship with the, the AFI. Uh, and worked on uh, several films with Cassavetes after that. So it, for me, it paid off. Um, it, it helped me form these relationships. It, it kept me curious and, and uh, wanting more out of, out of relationships um, with directors. And that's, uh, you know, that's what it was about for me. Yeah, Barbara. So, you know, w the, this isn't about me so much, but the reason that the AFI maintains its independence is because of the strength of the structure of its program. You have a person uh, who runs a narrative workshop, and whoever that person is, is really key to you know, helping you develop a, a personal voice. And when we were there, it was Deju Magyar. Before that, it was Tony Valeni, who you know, taught people like Carl Franklin. And even after uh, Deju, I think Frank Pearson, even though he came from the Hollywood system, had made some pretty edgy, smart films. So it was, you know, they set a very high standard and, and 
Also, when, when we wanted to go to the FI, we looked at all the filmmakers who came before us, Carl Franklin, Fred Elms, um, you know, Lynch, uh, you know, Amy Heckerling, who actually went to both NYU and, and AFI, mm. I think. But it was also mm. known as, so as a place that was developing, you know, female voices. And every film I made there had a strong female protagonist. My own work is kind of uh, comedic and entertaining, but I, I made a film with a 12-year-old, made a film with a 30-year-old, I made a film with a 40-year-old, and then I made a film with a 75-year-old woman. All of them, you know, all female leads, and that was really encouraged. I also want to say that one of my, I had some amazing instructors there, both from Hollywood and, and from Europe. One was Yvonne Passer, who was incredibly mm. influential, but also Dan Petrie was fantastic, because it was good to get some of that it was good to know what was going on in the studio system. Dan Petrie, I was having a few issues. I have a classmate here, Carmen Vega. Uh, where's Carmen? But um, Dan once said to me, because I was having some problems with a few of my, my male classmates and crew members, <laughs> and he said, Barbara, he said, go on the set tomorrow, walk, walk into the middle of the stage, spit on the floor, say the sticks go here on a 50 pointing that way. Right? <laughs> and he said, don't let him give you any shit. You know, so it was good to, it was sort of, you know, in between sort of the New York independent world and the studio world. You know, it was kind of a combination. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll use that story to segue into talking about the Director Workshop for <laughs> Women program. So maybe, Terry, could you tell us? <laughs> no, oh, I'm no, no, no. Okay, she has got it. Sorry, sorry. Um, Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> this, this program is near and dear to my heart. And it started in 1973 because a woman by the name of Matilda Krim, mm. who was married to Arthur Krim, had come here after they got married, and she was a, a research scientist in Israel. And she went out to Hollywood, and she said, Arthur, there are no women directors in Hollywood. Why is that the case? And she came to the AFI, and she said, start a program. Mm. And she, she was doing her research now um, in part at the Rockefeller Institute, so she went to the Rockefeller Foundation. And Jan Haig put this fabulous proposal together with Tony Villani, and it was for $200,000. And women would make films that would go on PBS. And the gentleman who was running the uh, arts program at the Rockefeller said it will take a couple of years to get a, a grant through of that size, but I can give you a personal grant of $35,000 what can you do with that? And that's how the directing workshop for women started. Here's the problem. <laughs> Here's the problem. It's still needed. Mm. Yeah. And this is the sad story. I'd like to think that things have changed. And they seem like they are moving in the right direction. But we still have a directing workshop for women. We still have a women in film, New York and LA. And this is an issue that our society has to deal with because the stories that Barbara and Barbara and all of you women have to tell are stories that our country and our world needs to hear. So this is a program that started early, that's still going, and we will not stop until, well, you know what? We'll probably keep, keep the program going because it's worth it. Terry. <laughs> I was just going to say that um, the year that it started, there were zero films directed by women in Hollywood and zero television series directed by women at uh, prime time. Some women were directing some soap operas at the time. But, um, and, uh, and, so, and there has been progress. I actually have the, uh, the figures. The um, <laughs> <laughs> since then, we now, in, last, in the last year, um, oops, where did I put that? Um, in the last year, there were, oops, this is it. It's hard to do it. I'm, not, I'm organizing, uh, yes. Okay, yes, 2016. 7% of the feature films were directed by hmm. women. Seven that number. 7% out, out of, in 45 years of making these incredible opportunities for really, you know, very, very talented women who, um, many have gone on to, they, many are part of uh, the 7%, um, but it's still such a, such a low number. Television a little bit better in 2016, 17%. That was up five 
percentage points from 2015. So we still have a really long way to go. I think there's some hope. Um, uh, there's a, a couple of people in Hollywood, uh, Victoria Alonzo, who, who uh, promised that all the women who direct Jessica Jones, will, all the people who direct Jessica Jones will be women. Ava DuVernay, who hires only women to direct her series, Queen Sugar. A number of men and women have made commitments to 50-50 in terms of directors, so I think in the next couple of years we'll see some real progress. I hope so, and I hope it doesn't. The 7% the number is the same number as was in 1998. Wow. So uh, there's, there's, a, there's a real need to change things, and I, and I hope that and the EEOC has investigated the Hollywood Studios and is mm. now in negotiations for the Hollywood Studios to to create some kind of um, programs that will address this problem, and I hope that they are, I hope that it's a really solid program that really, really does a lot of work for, to, to change things um, for women. I did want to mention that NBC Universal, with the help of Leslie Linka Glatter, who is a graduate of the Directing Workshop for Women, has directed hundreds of hours of television, executive producer on House of Cards, is now directing the- Homeland. I mean, Homeland, and, uh, and is now directing the, the Law and Order about the Menendez brothers. Uh, developed this program with NBC Universal, we'll t where 10 women will have the opportunity to shadow people, directors on shows, and then have the opportunity to direct an episode. And Universal and Fox also have programs. I mean, the studios are starting to think about it. Yes. When we see the well, numbers Well, they're starting change. to be forced to think about it by the EEOC, however, so yeah. I'm glad they're thinking about it, but um, it shouldn't have taken this long. That's for sure. Yeah, I'd like to jump in here, too, if I could. Um, I was at a film festival, and there was this extraordinary woman sitting in front of me. I think the film festival was called Filmex in Los Angeles. Yes, and this wonderful woman had her film that she was showing from the Women's Directors Workshop. Her name is Lee Grant. Mm. And Lee Grant is, was an exceptional, is an exceptional actress. She won an Academy Award for Supporting Actress in Shampoo as well as many other things. And she was showing her first film that was directed by her called The Stronger, which was written by um, Strindberg. And I was getting up the guts to, to <laughs> say hello to her and to congratulate her. And I did, and I said, you know, this is wonderful what you've done, and I just really wanted to meet you. And she was also blacklisted by the House of the Un-American Activities. She couldn't, um, you know, she wasn't in many parts because she stu stuck up for her husband and wouldn't talk about him, so she had to really struggle as a background. And then I said, you know, we share something. And she said, what? And I said, well, I got a grant from the AFI and my film Harlan County is showing here too. And she said, oh, I've heard about it, I wanna see it. Mm. And so I went to her panel, which she was talking about, you know, the House on the Un-American Activities after her film showed, and we became lifelong friends uh, from that. I went to 14 of her New Year's Eve parties <laughs> until she <laughs> <laughs> decided to <laughs> stop, yeah, decided to stop having them. They were the wildest things, but I just have so much love and respect, and she was at the very first. How were they wild? Women, huh? Tell us about that. <laughs> oh, I will. Uh, Robert Altman had his oh. contingency, and he was getting everyone stoned. Right. <laughs> oh, now we get it. And Troy Donahue was, I mean, the most unbelievable wow. people were there. So, yes, it was great. <laughs> Sylvia Miles, I mean, everybody. We had a ball when we went there. And different singers from Broadway would come and oh, 
how play on the piano it. and we'd all get around and sing songs and so it was quite wonderful. <laughs> Terry. I just wanted to add one uh, one other statistics statistic that I brought with me which is a uh, very hopeful um, even though it's it's still uh, annoying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, but this year, so so you can't get a job as a director in television unless you've been a director in television, um, or if you're a man. So um, this year, out of the uh, first-time directors that were hired, uh, 20, 225 people, 32% um, or 73 were women. Hmm. So so that's uh, it's still only 32%, but that's closer to 50 than it's ever been before. It was 24% last year. Um, also, there's been an increase in minority women first-time directors, up from six last year to 18 this year. Mm -hmm. Still not a number that we would be proud of, but it's, there certainly is progress. And I wanted to point out that the DWW, by training these women and having these women be among even this small percentage of people, opened the doors for many other women. And, uh, and so it, was, it really is and remains a critical um, vehicle for women to get a chance to, to direct and to break into the business. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll put in a plug for um, Mudbound, which is directed by a woman director, African-American woman named Dee Reese, and it's one of, the best, one of the best films of the year. So, an NYU, NYU graduate, but. Um, so, I, actually, one thing I did, did, another sort of general topic I wanted to touch on was just um, how things have changed or not, not changed. You know, we hear, Terry talk, and you realize there's been some progress, but in a way things have stayed the same. The AFI has gone through, um, I mean, the industry has changed so much. There, you know, I think one of the biggest changes in the history of this whole art form has been the digital revolution. Um, you were, you know, you were there early on and seeing the relation between motion pictures and television. You had um, CBS involved with, with your board. So I don't know if this is uh, maybe sort of a general topic, but how have you dealt with the incredible flux in the, in the art form? A lot of the book is really devoted to this 50-year history of dramatic change. I mean, for the first 100 years of filmmaking, everything was the same, basically. <laughs> yes, oh yeah, we did have sound, we did add color, but basically filmmaking was the same. Now it's totally different totally different. So institutionally, if you're interested in not-for-profits, educational, academic institutions, you know, Barbara, Elizabeth, I mean, we're all dealing with the same issues, a total change in how you make movies. And as an exhibitor's daughter, how <laughs> you watch movies. So it, it's, um, I'll, I'll let Jamie jump in here, uh, it's really, the AFI 50-year history is, is this story of change, but everything changes. Now we just have it technological. Uh, and what's terrifying to me is that as much as changed in the last 20 years, it's gonna change more than that in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. so, so how do you prepare? How do you prepare? The, uh, and the answer at AFI always was uh, focus on storytelling, focus on visual storytelling, the visual and sound, uh, that it, it really is about narrative. That doesn't change. The size of the screen changes, the method of delivery changes. Our focus has been on uh, the social experience of going to the movies, the cultural impact of that social experience. That focus has stayed the same. In the 90s, we made a major commitment to digital technology uh, that and had a, an incredible ride with that. AFI became a major change agent, that's covered uh, extensively in the book, became a major change agent through a partnership initially with Apple and then with a whole series of uh, companies in the new technologies where we could do training workshops, we could provide access to tools, we could get people together who otherwise probably wouldn't have and we became a major change agent, and that was a that had a huge impact actually on the community at, uh, over those oh good uh, eighteen years. Jamie tell the Apple chapter, which is like ten pages. Apple came to Los Angeles and said, "We need to be in this community." Nineteen ninety. We have no idea what to do, no idea how to reach the creative community. 
And what did they do? They gave us a million dollars worth of boxes, hmm. computers. Yeah. That's how it started. Hmm. It's, a, it, it's fascinating. It, it was, but it was something that interested uh, us from the very beginning. In, in 1980, we came in with a relationship with Sony. That was already, it was like things were being redefined even at that point. And AFI had the vision to say, okay, storytelling on a screen is what we're about. It's like the railroads not realizing, thinking they were in the railroad business and not realizing they were in the transportation business. We said, no, we're in the story, visual storytelling field. This, this is the trouble. Jamie and I worked together for so long we that, you know, he's, it, you know, I, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> no, it's really, really true. But it just, uh, I thought after I retired that we had not covered the, the changing technology world. And I was fascinated to go back and do the research and read all the things we had written, read through all the board minutes. All we talked about was technology. Hmm. And yet during the time that we were living it, w we didn't know what was going on. Yeah. But some, it, it's, and so looking back is really a fascinating experience to be, to be able to say, Oh, we knew something was going on, and then it just jumped out at us. And the, the first book we did before we did Becoming AFI was a tribute to the great master teacher at AFI, Tony Villani. And what had happened was uh, one of his, uh, one of the fellows one of the, uh, taped him in really what was almost the last year he taught, taped his lectures all year long, paid to get them edited down. Hmm. Uh, we inherited a manuscript and we said, wait a minute, th this is like the aesthetics of classic film. And it really was the Way to go, Jamie. All right. <laughs> well you never that's probably Tony calling. <laughs> yeah. And we give this book out to every incoming we call them, we still call them fellows, sorry about that, uh, <laughs> at the AFI Conservatory. And this book, the, the, the Fred, you know, Tony's words are now something that has become really almost a cult um, lecture at the AFI because it is only about narrative storytelling. That's what it's about. But that's, 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 that was where my roots at the AFI because it was Frank Danielle and Tony Villani who ran the show, who were the core of, of everything we learned about storytelling and why, why we do it. And we looked at how we do it, and we looked at how other filmmakers did it. Uh, we analyzed, we ran, I mean, I remember sessions where we would all sit in, in the big auditorium and, and look at a film, look at one scene of a film, look at it frontwards, look at it backwards, look at it with sound, look at it without sound, look at it, you know, one frame at a time if necessary, just to figure out what the director happened. had in mind and how they got the effect that, that they wanted. So it really paid off for us. And, and on, on, on the issue of technology, I, I know, you know the technology is something we live with and it changes around us and we help change it. You know, I, I sit on the board at the American Society of Cinematographers and, and I realize that's one of the things we talk about at board meetings is the technology, the race of technology and how we keep up with it and how we as cinematographers influence uh, how standards are written and how, how the industry works and, and what the influence of the filmmaker is all the way through the line of distribution. Um, but you know, to your point about Sony and Apple, they, they lead in the technology and, and it's their responsibility to bring, you know, to to give us the tools that yeah. they have, yeah. that you don't expect an educational institution to buy those tools, I don't think. You know, they make plenty of money. You know, <laughs> and 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 we I don't know, Barbara, we do you get them free? We don't. <laughs> we you know, we support them because we've learned on their tools. Um, you know, they owe us I just wanted to point out that also the, the student that you're referring to is Gary Winnick, mm. who went on to start yeah. Indigent, which was the first fully digital film production company in New York. Yeah, and, and, and actually Gary, uh, as Gary was a beautiful human being. And um, 
he sent uh, he sent the manuscript. I'm embarrassed by this. He he graduated in '86. He sent the manuscript in '92. And he, uh, he said, I hope AFI can get it published. And what did I do? I put it in the file. And I found it in 2011. And God bless him, two months earlier, he had passed away of brain mm. cancer at 49. Wow. And I have you know, chills talking about him because he was, a, as I said, a beautiful person. And so Jamie and I said, we have to get this book published. And that's really how this journey really started. And his executor was kind enough to give us money to self-publish the book and, and set up a scholarship in Gary's name at AFI. And it was during, um, it still took us three years to get it printed, uh, but it was during that time that I said to Jamie, I have our next project. <laughs> AFI's 50th is gonna be 2017, here we are. It took us another three years, but um, it's it's really very gratifying to, to to see an actual book, you know, yeah. <laughs> and to have that history there, and it'll be there now forever. So, great. And Fred, you'd be happy to know that uh, they give the book, the Tony Bellani book, to sure. every incoming uh, fellow, quote unquote, uh. when they come in every year in September. They get, and it's this big cult thing because it's classic dramaturgy. It's classic cinema dramaturgy. You read it and you go, oh, this is the, this is the poetics of, of classic cinema. And it's a, a wonderful read. It, it works very well. And the other part of the book that I, I that one of my favorites is the visions of light section, because mm. that was also technology driven. Uh, perhaps my favorite project at AFI was visions of light, which Terry, uh, Terry carried the water on. Uh, it was a, uh, the, we were approached by the Japanese uh, NHK who had money to promote this new thing called uh, high definition television. And they said, you know, do you have a project in mind that we could do something with if we came up with funding? And, and uh, I thought, well now what's, that's kind of counterintuitive. It's interesting. If you look at, you know, this is, this is a video format, wouldn't it be interesting to look at cinematography? <laughs> because somehow, that look at classic film cinematography uh, with this new format. And it became, so it was in that sense, technology driven. And if you've ever had a chance to see Visions of Light, it truly is a love letter to visual storytelling <coughs> and the, the fine, fine art of the cinematographer. Uh, with, the, with all the passion, thanks to Todd McCarthy, one of the, one of the great uh, cinema minds, uh, it really, yeah. uh, it, it sings that song very well. Do you want to say, I, I, that was, yeah, go ahead. I was, I was give just going to say my favorite line from the movie is, was Fred Elms um, talking about how uh, he and David Lynch would sit around for hours talking about how black is black. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Perfect. That actually, I was waiting for a segue to the Eraserhead clip, so uh, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll jump on that opportunity, but. Um, okay and then let you say a word about Eraserhead, and then we'd we'll open it up to the audience. Um, so let's just watch, Fred um, chose a, a scene to show. It's not the perfect condition because we're watching a video clip of it, so, but let's run the clip we have from Eraserhead.
that's just a taste of that amazing movie. Um, I don't know. Just what what can you say about the like the that I, first of all that was produced over a long period, right? And, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, um, you know, Eraserhead was was um, was you know truly the vision of 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 David Lynch, the director. Um, he uh, had, uh, I mean, uh, the history was uh, b very briefly was he had written a different script and tried to get that film made at the AFI and hadn't gotten anywhere developing it uh, with them and, uh, you know, finally uh, uh, threw up his hands and said, okay, here's the one I want to make and gave them this script, which was, which was only like, I don't know, 10 pages long <laughs> or so. Um, and 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 they said, okay, okay, you know, here, go do this. Um, and 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 David, you know, it shows his persistence. But but AFI was very very supportive. They gave us uh, equipment and they gave us a place. And when it became clear that this wasn't going to be an ordinary film, nor was it going to be, you know, ten minutes or f even forty minutes long, um, you know, that David had something bigger in mind, um, they went with it and they allowed us to to kind of do it at our own pace, uh, which was extremely slow. Uh, so <laughs> it was made uh, by a handful of people over, over a period of, of, of um, three or four years, basically. Right. Um, it just took forever. <laughs> uh, and parts of it were shot at the AFI and when we were uh, in Beverly Hills, and parts of it were shot in my backyard in you know, a small bungalow in, in yeah. you know, Los Angeles. And, in my living room and everywhere else around. So, you know, we did what we had to do to get it made. Um, in reality, it's an experimental film in that nobody really knew quite what they were doing. We were all trying, trying it on for size. But in in the spirit of the support we got from the AFI, they would connect us with people with Hollywood professionals, and we could go and ask a question and. And we would say, well, how, uh, uh, how would you do this? Uh, you know, we'd explain some complicated shot we had in mind, and they'd say, well, you just do this. And then we'd say, well, uh, we don't have that kind of money. And then they'd say, well, OK, in the old days, here's what we used to do. Mm -hmm. And we'd do it in the old days method. You know? And then it was all making effects in camera and, and, uh, and, and, and kind of doing it by hand, as it were. But it, it is David's vision, and, and the, the good thing is that David believed in it. We believed in David, and the AFI believed in us, and uh, you know helped us along. Did he, did he think he was gonna that it was gonna wind up in movie theaters? Like it, it was. It, did you think it was an, a, a, like a sort of a thesis film? It had this weird life. It was like a midnight movie. I remember seeing well, it at the Cinema was, One on yeah, theater on Third it was Avenue. A strange, yeah, it was a strange hybrid. Um, <laughs> David, uh, there was never any doubt in his mind that it was find an audience. He believed in it the whole wa the whole while. Um, um, it showed at, at this film festival, Film X. It was the, it was the uh, it was the midnight mystery film at Film X, right. and you know it showed uh, one night in the middle of the schedule uh, at midnight. They wouldn't announce who was in it or what the name of it was or who made it. You just showed up, and it was packed. You know, it was just a wonderful, a wonderful thing. However, the, the theater was so quiet. After the after the last frame of film, no one knew quite, you know, what to do with it. <laughs> um, but but, you know, several months later, uh, David did get a distributor, and uh, and it went into uh, it went into a theater. He made a couple of little edits in the film. It went into uh, the Waver what was the Waverly Theater, in New York. Yeah, yeah. It played midnights. That was the print. That was the only print that existed of the film. Um, and it showed for about six months um, before we actually uh, made some money and struck another print. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I do want to let everybody know we're, we're having, just to make sure you know, we're having a reception afterwards that you're all invited to. We'll just right down the hall, we have a little room called the Fox Amphitheater. You'll finally be able to get your hands on this book you've been hearing so much about. So, um, and we could probably convince you to sign some copies. Um, but you're all invited to that. But I, I do want to take some time to take some questions from the audience. Uh, so feel free to jump in right here. That's my brother. We have a picker here. <laughs> yeah. I, I, don't, I don't have a question. I have a, I have a story about Jeannie. OK. <laughs> you want a mic? <laughs> we got a microphone for you. Oh, no, we have, to, we have to put you on mic. Thank you. The, uh, <clears throat> this is not planned. It's just give you an, it'll just give well, you a sense of the 
world that Jeannie grew up in. Uh, during the Second World War, Lowe's Theaters, for whom my father worked, uh, supplied the delivery of 16 millimeter prints to uh, army stations, navy ships, whatever, as, as a obvious courtesy to the, uh, to the war effort. And uh, Dad had the opportunity to take a 16 millimeter print home the that night it arrived and the next day it was going to be shipped out so we could see it at home. And our home was on Central Park West and the living room was quite long and there was a foyer and beyond the foyer was a dining room. And Dad put the projection machine in the foyer and after every reel, because most movies were three reels, stopped, changed the reel and it was really irritating. And so he said to mother, I'm going to do a few things. Don't get too upset. She said, what are you going to do? She said, don't worry. It'll be fine. So what he did was he went into the dining room and he cut two holes in the wall of the dining room. And then he bought a second projector and he had two projectors and he could show the movie without a break. That's the world she grew up in. <laughs> That's good. That explains a lot. That's good. <laughs> That's great. I told you it was a great childhood. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yes, yeah, sir. Question regarding um, uh, women directors and, and the obstacles. Um, is it a DGA issue? Is it a, is it a, I know it's hard enough to break into the business as it is. I'm in, I'm in television and I know even in television, a lot of directors are, are all men, and all the first ADs are men, and all the second ADs, you know, first ADs you may get some women in there, but I just don't know what the process is for moving up the ladder and becoming an actual director. I know you're already in the guild probably by then, but is it an obstacle from a... The guys who, who give the green light were afraid to give the gals the opportunity to spend their money because they felt much more comfortable with the guys losing their money than letting a woman have a chance. I can give you exa an example. There's, a, there's a, f a showrunner who's one of our members who's on a show that's been on the air for many, many years on CBS, and uh, Blue Bloods. I'll just tell you what it, what it is. <laughs> and yeah. she, uh, the showrunner, who's a very fa fairly powerful person in the television structure, wanted 50% women th for this past season. And she told whoever was supposed to go get these women to go get these women. Well, they came back with three women, and one of them was her. One of, one of them was the showrunner. So two, they only found two women that could direct the shows. And th this is a regular series, so it's 26 episodes. Um, she, uh, and so she asked, well, where, where, where are all the women? And he said, that, well, they're all working. The only ones that CBS would approve are all working. So there's a list you have to be on, and if you're not on that list, you can't get a break, and you can't get on the list unless you have a real um, sponsor or a champion who's going to take a risk with his, and it's usually his, own career to get you on. And so that's why it's so important for, for everyone in the industry to say, we're going to make this commit commitment, and we're going to make it happen. The talent is out there. There's no doubt about that. It's just a question of people taking, making the commitment to make it happen. Yeah, and um, what Terry was saying is so right because um, the wonderful Tom Fontana um, gave me the opportunity to do um, a lot of homicide life on the streets. Uh, and the first one, <laughs> I guess he was testing me, was called the documentary. <laughs> and <laughs> yes, but little to my surprise, it was harder than any other film, and um, because it had all the characters in it, and it was another character that was doing a documentary, and so when the actors found out, oh, this documentarian is doing it, we can get away with murder. <laughs> so Yafit Kodo, you know, who was <laughs> the chief of their boss you know, called me over at a break and he went, and I said, yes. 
And he said, I don't have any lines, Barbara, so I can just go to my honey wagon, you know, because I don't have any lines. I said, no, 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 Yafet, you can't. You're the boss. You cannot miss anything. And I can't believe I said this. And I said, and when we put the camera on you, that's the money shot. <laughs> <laughs> And he bought that. <laughs> that. Yes, Andrew Brower, we were doing <laughs> a scene, and it was in a bar, and he said, so you're a documentarian, so we only do one take. Uh. I said, oh no. Every documentarian does not leave a stone unturned. We will be here until we get it perfect. Anyway, right. but as being a documentarian and then transitioning to do this, you're not afraid of anything, you know, because you're looking for truth and people aren't going to intimidate you except this grandchild. <laughs> okay, Barbara, Hi. go ahead. Hi, so first of all, I just want to say that you have a few of the most important women in film on the stage right now. Jean Furstenberg, the first you know, female head of a film school. Barbara Koppel, one of the first women directors in the country who I used to read articles about avidly. And Terry, who started the, the very important directing workshop for women and continuing now with women in film. I think we should applaud them. And you, and you. <laughs> but what I want to tell you is that it's, it's a little more complicated what's happening now. Uh, the federal government is starting to get involved. So there was, there were a couple of lawsuits in the 70s and 80s brought uh, by some women who were in the DGA. What were they called? The Gang of Six or something. And Victoria Hochberg was yeah. in yes. that group. Victoria Hochberg. And they, and they failed Shuffle miserably. Yeah. And, and you know, it was kind of a backlash, a backlash to the women's movement. And it wasn't until recently, and, and the Directors Guild was not doing enough. They were lumping uh, a gender parity together with diversity, and it wasn't working for them. And there was a conflict of interest because they were running these programs, and there were a lot of men at, the, at running these programs. So some women got together, particularly a woman named Maria Giza, and she approached the ACLU and talked and showed them the numbers, the employment numbers, which are terrible. And the ACLU decided miraculously to take it on right after gay marriage. And they did, they opened a, a website. It said, tell us your story. I wrote in, everybody wrote in. And they, they compiled this amazing evidence and published this 15-page letter, which is really interesting reading. And they demanded that the EOC look into it, and they did. And so they've been taking testimony for the last year and a half, I think. And it's all very confidential and under wraps. But here's the good news. So. We were worried when Trump uh, was elected because there can be a change in EOC at that time. But the EOC said, no, we're, we're continuing with the investigation. Um, we've heard there was a leak. Uh, it was in Deadline Hollywood that, uh, there, that the EOC is in settlement talks with the studios right now. The problem, the reason it, the, the, of such imbalance is that it's a, a business of personal relationships and nepotism where they, there's, they self-regulate. We need this. And the reason they can self-regulate is because they, the studio is up here, but they work with all these production companies, right? And so everybody works, the, the directors and actors work as independent contractors. But the EEOC now is saying that we have to look at them as employees. It's, it's hap What's great is that episodic television is allowing them to do that because the companies are, are hiring more directors. Uh, so they're taking it to the studios under Title VII, which is the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And we think we're going to succeed. If the studios don't go along with it now, they will go to court. Here's the good news. Weinstein is tragic, terrible stories, but it's going to help this, uh, this EEOC investigation. So. Thank you. OK, yeah, thanks great. a lot. OK. Um, we are, um, we're going to have to wrap up, but we will continue the conversation out there. I do want to just um, to end it. Before we end, I want to give um, the filmmakers, because I heard a little bit about your, the projects you're working on. Paul, I love the project. You're, I don't know if you want to say anything about it, but I want to give uh, Paul and Fred and Barbara a chance to tell us what you're working on now, if you, wanna, if you can reveal anything about what you're doing. Oh, um, yeah, I think oh, it's on. Well, r right now, I've always wanted to do something about the disco era in, <laughs> in terms of a musical, uh, particularly because of uh, what was happening with LGBTQ youth on the piers and how 
disco club, you know, Donna Summer, mm -hmm. you know, that whole period, was a safe haven from everything, of course, that we're still now dealing with. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and that's through, we have a, a production arm at the New York Film Academy that produces original movie musicals. Mm. Um, so this sort of came about earlier. In fact, the, sup the supervising producer and editor is sitting out here. Great. Um, and so that's what I'm working on. And then this, this uh, new feature uh, that'll happen right after that, th it's a, about Hamlet and Horatio, uh -huh. that, that I'm not sure how I'm going to do it yet. <laughs> um, but it's all shot in front of green screen. Uh, you know, it's about their relationship. It's a deconstruction of the piece. So... Great. That's what I'm working on. The, the movie <laughs> musical shoots in like two months. Oh, good so. luck. That sounds great. <laughs> so good luck with it. Fred? I'm, um, I, I'm shooting uh, some feature films as well as some television uh, miniseries. I worked on the last year's uh, The Night Of that was on HBO. Um, and I'm doing now one um, called uh, Looming Tower, which is based on uh, Lawrence Wright's book about the, the events that led up to 9-11. So still, still keeping busy <coughs> and doing more l sort of longer form dramatic television work. Barbara. Yes, I have a couple of documentaries out there. Um, a Murder in Mansfield, which is having its world premiere at Doc NYC. Uh, this is Everything GG Gorgeous, which is playing the next night. And I'm doing this extraordinary film. Uh, it's about sponsors in Canada, sponsoring Syrian and Iraqi families and bringing them to Canada. I'm having competition again. <laughs> Sit on my lap. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's wonderful. <coughs> and it's having these boys go to a boys camp in Canada, um, which has American boys and Canadian boys, and there's no running water. Mm. There's outhouses, you bathe in the lake, and you paddle canoes, and you go up portals, and you really learn, and it shows how they change over the course of the summer. These young boys who have had all these terrible experiences and, of course, the backstories of their parents. So that's what I'm working on now. It's all shot. You're still making films where there's no running water or plumbing. It's like, <laughs> I don't know. What I got used to it. <laughs> uh, you get the last word. Oh, I, David, I just want to thank you for this opportunity. It's been so wonderful to have all of you here. You know, I, I wish we'd had this conversation before we wrote the book because we could have had a lot more stories. And thank you all for coming. Okay, and, and please join us. Yeah.